So it's not coincidence that we have met today and we are together today. Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to listen today to Shaheen, first of all. He's going to introduce every one of us uh, why they're here. Because this Bill Papalas team is actually talking about storytelling. And these three people, actually, three groups I invited are, for me, the most incredible people I ever met during my travels, not only because they are intelligent, bright, beautiful, but also because they have something so special and so unique and the understanding why storytelling is so important, not only for themselves or for the community, but also how to connect with each another one over the world by doing what they're doing. And actually today we're going to see a little bit of their bubble, of their home, of their space. So I actually want to invite Shaheen to come up front Welcome to everybody. Um, it's always difficult to start. Beginnings are not necessarily the best place to begin, but uh, let's begin at somewhere where I think which can help us to understand why Raquel is doing what she's doing, why maybe it's necessary for us to hear the people that Raquel has brought together. It is, at the end of the day, uh, a diverse set of presentations by a diverse group of people. Here we have, as Raquel has mentioned, people from different countries, different continents even, who are a couple of them here in Europe for the first time. So in this gathering today, what is important to understand is how do we allow this conception that Raquel has asked us to consider? What are the breaks that she will bring, has brought in front of us? What is it that has been forgotten, which is, remains incomplete, can be resolved by hearing the people who are here today? What is the further work that the stories will do for us, which maybe we should have done in the first place? We have an unforgotten possibility of remembering now, or if I, if I rephrase that again, we might have the possibility to realize the realities of Europe and Westernism through these people. Now, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go deeper into that, because their narratives today, which we're going to experience, might seem like instances in our lives, but these are lives we have spent generations doing and creating their narratives. These are not new narratives, which we are going to hear. What they signal and touch upon is the colonial wound, which has never healed. What they signal is the faithlessness with which we've dealt blows to the indigenous cultures in the world. Raquel heard things a decade ago they have stayed with her, and she's brought them here to make sure that we also are part of what she had heard and what she remembers, and it's her desire to make sure we also feel and understand why that was necessary for her. So we have two colleagues from Colombia, Sindra Tatiana Gonzalez Apuana. She is a contemporary weaver from the Wayu people. And she is accompanied by Stefania Doria, a curator from Santa Marta, Colombia. And of course, we have Jonathan Dube, also known by his clan as Sameta, and Araba, who has accompanied him here today. The worlds which are going to be explored, exposed, by the, the people who are going to be speaking today. It's not only necessarily about sharing stories, but it's about sharing their realities. These realities are elsewhere, to a large extent, for most of us. And they come at times like this to these cultural ambassadors, 
uh, as not necessarily as ambassadors, but to speak about when they're allowed to, to make fertile our ground, and then they go away. What is said, what is spoken, what is uttered, what is opened, what is situated, what is possible? What are the horizons? How do we contemplate? What is the place of struggle? And how is another reality illuminated? Are all the things which we're going to try and work through today. It's a lot, all right? But in small, small bites, hopefully today, what will happen is you'll be able to understand through these people what needs to be done because they're already doing it. A few years ago, I started to travel through Colombia to do actually an a sort of research about female social leaders, because at the moment there's a lot of women in Colombia who actually are focusing on communities, helping communities um, with money, bringing children to school, make it more safe on the street and so forth. And Fia Fia, a friend of mine, we actually ended up at Sindri. And she is doing something amazing I haven't seen before so far and so powerful is that she understands craftsmanship in her community, the Woyu community in La Bahira in the northern part against Venezuela. Um, and because she understands the history and the power of that, um, she wants to show it to the world as the community, the Woyu community in Colombia uh, are actually very much struggling now, politically, um, but also when it comes to resources, most of the time there's no water and whole villages will stay without water or money for months or weeks. Uh, but because of her craftsmanship and because she understands how she can unify women in the community, uh, she actually started her own company, let's just say a foundation company, where all these women are coming together and via weaving, via really old school craftsmanship, she is actually talking about her cultural heritage and uh, trying to bring the community back together. Um, and also, Stefania, uh, as a curator and working with a lot of artists, students, you've been like one of the best persons now on this road and also as translator, we've been going through an incredible couple of adventures where people were shooting while sleeping in hammocks outside, still like almost getting lost and <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> uh, but I actually, first of all, I like you guys to maybe talk a little bit about your practice. So uh, Sindri uh, needs to do a, a little ritual to start out this conversation and ask to her ancestors to everything goes right and everything flows in the best way ever. So, Sindri. Hola. Every step we have taken is a thread woven into our life, truly reflecting our journey, especially when I hear stories that I will never forget and learn more about our ancestral generation to answer questions that I had a few years ago. My name is Sindri Gonzalez. My mother is from the Eriku Ipuana clan, and I'm from the Eriku Ipuana clan. I am the daughter of Goriyu because my father is Goriyu and I am the granddaughter of maternal grandparents from the Ipuana clan and paternal grandparents from Goryu and Epi clans. This bracelet has been given to you is a legacy from our grandmother's grandmother Waleke and reminds us the relationship with nature. This bracelet gives us energy to desire to weep eliminates laziness, uh, activates creativity, and is given to you without the love from the women artisans from the Wayu culture. Why we're here is we talk about storytelling. I've been, we've been experiencing a lot of stories together, uh, but also in conversations, what we had before was like, how can we actually put our stories out there, fear cultural, fear heritage, fear craftsmanship. And I think to understand for people who never been connected to the Wayu community is that it is actually a community that is like really carried by women. And I actually want to start about with that. 
Bueno, eh, nuestra comunidad. The first is the Hair Community is located in La Guajira. It's called Punta Coco. And the women has a, an extremely relationship with the her community because as you see in the back, well, every single back and every single women thing is uh, means like a, a special part of her community. She's trying to explain us how is living between all having all this knowledge and resources, but also trying to survive in these conditions and situations. It takes hours to arrive to her community. You have to drive into the desert. There's no road, so if the rain falls down, it's impossible to cross takes like, I don't know, almost four hours to the closest town. That's the excuse for the government to never arrive there and help them with the basic things that they need to uh, preserve and keep the community uh, working on. But they are a really resilient uh, community. They are trying to keep the, the knowledge and also the wisdom around the women to keep the, the community close to the, this kind of uh, believers and uh, the, the women is always something that helps the community to survive in the, in, into the, these situations. It's an old community. They travel. There are nomads going from Venezuela to Colombia to the islands and forth and back. So can she tell us, or maybe talk a little bit more about how the, this preservation works, how she keeps the stories there? Bueno, este, la the Guayu culture is an oral culture. There's nothing in a text. It's created by colors and symbols, and that's the reason that you won't find a, a, a book about them. All this wisdom and the information about the culture is kept by the grandparents. They are like the books for the community. They teach the others what they have to believe or how the, the nature works in them. And the other part of the wisdom of the Wayu community is the women, because in, into the whips they print uh, the meanings of the, all the nature around there. So that's the reason that women is a really important part into the communities. She wants to give you an example of this with this bag, because maybe you think that is just an object and maybe something, a fashionist subject. But for them, it's more than that, because all these patterns that you can see there means something about the nature, or something about the ancestors. All this cultural system work in a special way, because when the women start weaving, the bottom of the back make, means when you were born. And then you start threading and threading and weaving and weaving like the life, like flowing with the life. And the top of the back uh, means that you will be a part of the heaven. You will be a part of the goddess and gods. That's the reason that when the back is over, it's something that you are giving to others to remember that thing that you have to born and then die and then go to this spiritual vision of heaven. These patterns are uh, into a big system of patterns that they have called Kanasu. For her community, it's so important that the Colombian government declare all this way of weaving origin denomination because they have like a few problems with designers in Colombia that they try to use these patterns and try to commercialize them and sell the, by their names. Right now, the laws protects this, uh, these women. That's a huge, a big step for them. What you see also in the clothes, in like everything, the like jewelry, uh, cups, you have symbolic details, visual details on it. And it preserves and it keeps the story within within a community and it goes via like talking, storytelling, oral ways, songs into the next generation. And my, uh, my curiosity is because how do you uh, continue the stories? How do all elder people come to, to sit down with younger people? Bueno, nuestra all this knowledge and all this wisdom, the women understand the importance of having this online and trying to preserve every single year. 
So they try to teach the, the new generations all the customs, the old customs about the community. They see that nature is in everything. So they try to keep this message alive because it's the only way to keep the balance between the heaven and earth. She's so, so grateful with Raquel because to the community has been really tough to tell the real story because the press and the Colombian media, they are always talking about the indigenous communities the wrong way. They never try to find the real stories and tell the stories from inside the communities. Just this Western way of think. She said before that the Catholic religion tried to banish all the customs and all the way they, they are living. So being in this place, talking about the community and talking about the ancestors, talking about the importance of telling the stories with their voices, not from outside, means a lot for her. What does she want to tell this audience to take from this conversation? In the Western way of living, they are always focused about the economical way of living on how to get money and how to get in business. For the Wayu people, they are focused on nature and for them it's really important having the fish in the waters around them or having the plants in the best way ever because they depend on them. It's not just they depend on the nature, it's because the nature is like the grandmother. Waleket, that is the name of the might of weaving, is a spider. So if the women is on a spider and call Waleket, she say Waleket is her grandma. They believe about the, the energy of the universe, the, the energy of the people, the energy of the nature. And if you can reflect this good energy on you and you have like a good heart and you are kind with the others and try to keep like a good relationship with the rest of human beings, it means that you are having this balance with the nature and you are like uh, in peace with all around you. You are so lucky because because you live in an amazing city. The city is full of things. And she's comparing a little bit with her community and all these tough situations that they had, like no water, no electric resources, sometimes no food. So you have to be really uh, grateful with this and then remember all the beauty that you have around. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, we have to finish all of up. <laughs> but thank you so much again. So Samait and I, we know each other for some years, 2015, 14 something, like when I first traveled to Zimbabwe to work with Admaya Kamsen Gerere, uh, to do a project on folk tales and taboos. I didn't know what I got myself into, <laughs> but it was good. And we started to talk and all of a sudden we understood that like the spiritual world and the art world in general, more or less the same, the way of storytelling and the connecting with energies. It's like you have some power I found in you when I was there that you are a f one of the few that actually realize what art can do and how important it is and how to tell that story. And especially because you're working with artists, you have a different way of looking at the world. And that's connecting with also your medical studies and like all the knowledge you have. But I think I should just invite you to the stage and um, so you can talk a little bit for yourself. The person you are looking at is a shaman. Shaman, um, the most demonized um, profession. <laughs> the most demonized profession to others, if they looked, uh, if they think of a shaman, they think a shaman is a person who, who casts spells, who, who has magic and different sorts of uh, devilish uh, activities, but it's different. It's the other way around. A shaman um, who learned 
shamanism through the original indigenous knowledge system ways. I learned the hard way. So in some years back, in 1992, uh, when I was um, around um, 16 years, something that I did not know, something that I, I did not figure out happened to me. I became ill, a very serious illness, a very serious illness that um, I almost lost my mind. Psychosis. My father was still alive at that time. So he had to take me to the hospitals, to the doctors, to everybody who tried to help me. But nothing materialized. He was given um, a, an advice by my big brother that, why can't you take this small boy to a healer or a spiritualist? He was told that there is a spirit, your forefather spirit, on this boy. I was taken for an initiation. I didn't like it. But our traditions, some of our traditions, uh, if, you are chosen, if you are chosen to do something, you have to accept it, whether I like it or not. So I was left in the bush for eight months. And the day I was told to stay in the bush, I was not prepared. I had no, no blanket, I had no, nothing to eat, I had no warm a room to stay. Uh, only me, my clothes, we won't manage this world if we are weak. So the life that I survived in the bush without any clothes, something to eat, the experiences were very serious. Eight hours of the day waiting for somebody to come back and take you home. When you wake up, you start to think again, what to eat, what to entertain you, what to give you a, another warp. I had to find activities because of hungry. Hunger gave me, a, changed me a lot. I was a potterer. I had to collect clay doing pottery by myself, uh, a mini, um, creating a kiln in the bush, trying to fire the, the plates and the clay pots for myself. I had my own industry, my own creativity, my own whatever. Those activities alone gives me, a, it relates me to, what, to how artists survive in the art studios. Mm -hmm. So at that time, the door was locked by the ancestors. For nobody should visit me to, and to tell me what to do in that situation. So the day they uh, visited me to, to take me home, I just hear a serious we still, they, they tried to make it very loud. So I was surprised. Who are those people? But they were coming closer and closer and closer. So at times you feel ashamed, shy, that who am I to be, to, to, to meet all those people? I'm not ready. I try to hide. Because at times uh, you fed up of uh, thinking of other people. I was fed up. And my mother was the person who tried to talk to me and she managed my mind and my heart. Yeah, she is my hero. <laughs> to become a shaman, you have to learn. learn. You have to learn to to be somebody who, who, can, who knows how to survive without anything. 
how to love one another. Then I had to allow them they had to come to my place and I had uh, a lot of things to show them, a lot of uh, experiences to, to share. Yeah, like dried meat. There were a lot of dried meat because as a hunter, how would you survive? Hunting was part of my activity. Uh, pottery, creating something was part of my activity. So I had a lot of things because to to nurture my mind, to make my mind work nearly every day alone, I had to do something. So if you want to to have yourself um, in good shape, to avoid crying and being weak or behave like a small child, you need to introduce something. I had a collection, meat, clay pots, clay plates, everything, making ink or paint or something, something to use uh, mix with clay so that I can uh, change the color of something. And it's not about education to become an artist. No, that's a spiritual initiation. It's a gift that is in you. You have guardian spirits on you that give you the inspiration, that gives you the, the, that visual mind to create art, to create something new for people to appreciate tomorrow. Uh, it means we are not just an ordinary person. The life that we think is ours is not ours. We don't own anything in this world. We own our flesh, this mortal body. The spirit that we breathe is in and out is not ours. Let's engage our true identity. That's where we come from. And that's where we are going. That's where we are heading. I've never traveled, tra traveled out of Africa. This is my first time. I would like to thank the Bali and um, everybody here. We are related. You don't know how important you are. Thank you very much. What has also happened here today is that we have been discussing quite difficult questions for the West, where we live in the Northern Hemisphere. We don't normally discuss spirits. The only spirit is the one which is sold in a bottle. We don't necessarily even talk about shamans. We don't talk about life and water in any way which is positive. We never think about, for instance, the notion of bush culture. We only talk about urban culture. I also misheard guardian spirits last night as garden spirits. Now, I wasn't even drinking, <laughs> all right? <laughs> but I like all these mishearings I've been having because mishearing, to a certain extent, is also about the moment of translation when you misheard or you misconstrued, and you actually came upon a different idea. So what might have happened here today, as a conclusion, is that we might have misheard a lot. At the same time, we heard a new form of knowledge by mishearing what we don't normally hear. But I also liked the ideas that certain things in art practice or thinking can eliminate laziness which was talked to us about Sindra. Sameta also said, we don't own anything. I like those ideas. Araba said, art has a potential to create change. These are such spectacular notions which can, in the long run, help us overcome what I earlier had called a polycrisis when we've got so much being thrown in our direction, we even don't know how to deal with our own breath. We can't breathe. So with that, I would like to thank you for making incredibly difficult questions and difficult conversations possible. Without you, 
it would not have been possible. And we are so much richer for that. And thank you, Raquel. Thank you, De Bailey, for bringing it forth. And the Mondrian funds.